I was in the barber shop and the phone rang and I said, the guy in Chicago for you, can you get up? I walked up with a bit around me. Hello? Hey, Ronnie, you want to come to Chicago? 500 bucks a week. Said, what? <laughs> <laughs> sat down back in the barber's chair and I started crying. That's, that's the Italian Sicilian in me. <laughs> Something could happen on this show, you never can tell. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's Pam from the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe. I'm Pam, and I have my good friend and partner in, in uh, crime here, uh, Joe Farina. Hi, Joe. How are you? Good, Pam. Good, good, good. Always great to see you. And I uh, hope everybody out there is doing well. Uh, spring is upon us, and hopefully better times are out there for everybody. Uh, before we introduce our incredible guest uh, tonight, just want to remind everybody out there, several ways you can learn about the Dick Biondi film. Uh, go to our website, dickbiondifilm.com. Check out our Facebook page and our Facebook group. Also, subscribe to uh, the Dick Biondi film uh, YouTube channel as well. Uh, the community is growing every week. It, uh, the Dick Biondi film community is growing, and it's all because of people like you out there who have expressed their love uh, for this very, very special film about uh, the legendary DJ Dick Biondi. Speaking of legendary DJs, um, in the 1960s, DJs electrified cities all across America, and here in Chicago, um, Ron Riley took his place at WLS, and he's one of the greatest DJs uh, ever. And we are so honored and, and delighted to have uh, Ron Riley on the Rock and Roll Show with Pam and Joe. Ron, how are you, sir? It's so good to see you, too. And I'm um, glad some uh, folks have checked in here. To the Ron Riley <laughs> Batman Hour. <laughs> That's out of the past, you know. But uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, Thank it's you. really a pleasure to have you, Ron. Thanks for joining us. Now, also joining us is a man named Clark Besh, also known as WLS Clark. And he happens to be a huge fan of Ron. Hi, Clark. How are you? Hello. <laughs> and I am the big fan you said I was. You are also a uh, collector of materials of all the people. I think a lot of people from back in the day in the 60s, um, musicians and artists and DJs. You, I, it seems like you do a lot of that kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to talk more about that. Okay. Ron. Uh, Yo. Yo. How did you get started, or how did you get interested and started uh, in, in radio? So far back, I hardly remember. <laughs> hey, Chicago is my hometown, and um, I was uh, born, raised there, and moved out to what was then the faraway suburbs, Highland Park, which is now <laughs> close-in <laughs> suburbs, and. Uh, Spent my time up in Antioch, uh, Illinois. Later on, we went up there uh, in the Chain of Lakes um, and um, went on to uh, get into radio. I always uh, <clears throat> like to chat, talk, and I haven't stopped yet. And uh, <laughs> I had a couple of opportunities to get into radio. And I said, boy, this would be really fun to do this. So I, I got into, um, when I was going to school up in Madison, I got into uh, the Madison radio station. Well, they wouldn't let me be on the air. You know, it was a classical music station. And I was just a kid, you know, so I got to be engineer anyway, and that was fun. But then um, at that time, they had the, the, the discs and the, the, the regular records. Well, if you ever don't know anything about classical music and you have to be an engineer trying to cue them up to the beginning, and then hold on to them as you did with those records. And then when the time came, you let them loose and they played. And I got some people writing in who were real neophytes about all of this. And they measured all of the beats and all of the notes that I missed in one night's concert. And they never wanted to hear me playing the records in there again. <laughs> so that was my, my first uh, long-winded 
conversation about radio, but I did get a job finally at WAPL in Appleton, Wisconsin, and uh, that was my first big DJ job. They decided that they were going to call me Smiley Riley, and I oh, yes, yes, <laughs> stop. <laughs> But everybody, everybody had a funny name on that station. It was a smile at the top of your dial, happy wapple. And uh, I was there for about a year. The company was owned by uh, Bartell Broadcasters who owned some TV stations. And they, uh, uh, I was on the airplane polka music down at Waukegan at WKRS, you know. And, hey, here's one for Shosh Ah, Happy birthday to y'all. And... Uh, Guy, guy called on the phone, the engineer said, there's a guy calling you on the phone. He says he owns some radio stations and he wants to talk to you about a job. I said, well, you knock it off. <laughs> yes, you know, and I just forgot about it. And then he slipped me the number and found out this guy, Jerry Bartell, who owned TV and radio stations, including Walkie in Milwaukee. And he said, um, we'd like to have you come down and do our all night show. Well, there I was. <laughs> and that was just the beginning. In answer to your question, how did you get into it? It's uh, it just, <laughs> just out of curiosity, uh, time frame wise, what, what years were, was, what year was this about uh, that you're talking about? What time well, frame? Elvis Presley was popular. And uh, there were a lot of new artists out there on rock and roll and they were making the big transition. I'm guessing that uh, when I went up to WAPL, it was probably 1954, something like that. And then 56, I was in Milwaukee. And uh, then a lot of things came around as it happens. And anybody who's ever been in our business, a lot of businesses, you know, you know, it, 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 one day chicken, one day feathers, you know. And so it, I learned one thing, never nail the carpeting down, you know, <laughs> just always go in and think you're going to do the best job you can. If they kick you out, the new program director comes in, you're gone. That happened to me in St. Louis. I went down to St. Louis for a minute, stores broadcasting. And we barely got settled. And, uh, you know, like they got a new program director, new this, new that. So I was out of it. Came back to Chicago. I was happy to. And I went to WJJD for a little while. Um, played some country tunes. I think they were country then. I don't remember. And um, then... Actually, it, it, things fizzled out a little bit on me. If I go too long, just interrupt, okay? Because I have, you know, this. Well, I this, do want to ask you oh. how you came to WLS and what did Dick okay. Biondi have to do with it? Uh, gee, Dick was uh, Dick was uh, my hero, too. When I was sitting up in Milwaukee listening to him, he, he was always a good guy. Hey, Ron. <laughs> you know, so we always, <laughs> we always had, had a good relationship. Uh, but it started out actually getting to Milwaukee, um, I mean, getting getting to Chicago, was during that, that time passage that I was uh, out of work, uh, so to speak, and, and not a terrible thing in our business to be that way sometimes. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, I got a call back up to Milwaukee, and they said, hey, Ron, would you like to come up to Milwaukee and do the afternoons for uh, a vacation fill-in? I said, oh, that'd be great. No sooner hung up, and Gene Taylor called from WLS, who was pr program director then, of course, and uh, said, Ronnie, how'd you like to come down here and sit in for Clark Weber on the all night show and starting tomorrow night, you know, on <laughs> East to midnight. And I said, I just told Milwaukee, I was going to be there. He said, take your pick Milwaukee or Chicago. You could do good. We could have a chance to hear you. Said, okay. So I did both of them. Actually, I, <laughs> I was living in Deerfield, Lincolnshire, which is right kind of in the middle between Chicago and Milwaukee. So, I went up there and did afternoons in Milwaukee, came home, slept an hour or two, and went down to Chicago to the all-night show. And that went on for about four weeks or so, and um, it, nothing happened. And then, of course, I went away to HK, WHK in Cleveland, got a job there. I no sooner got there, and somebody called me, I forgot who it was, Stan Dale or Clark, and said, hey, we got some stuff going on here, you know, and it looks like Biotti's going to want to leave, wants to leave. And you may have a chance, so call Taylor. <laughs> I said, okay. So I called Taylor. He didn't answer. I called the secretary. She didn't answer. And of course, we didn't have cell phones then, so I kept leaving the number where I was. Well, still nobody was calling me. And then all of a sudden, I got a call on the phone from um, Gene Taylor, but I was in the barbershop. 
and the phone rang and I said, the guy in Chicago for you, can you get up? So I walked up with a bib around me. Hello? Hey, Ronnie, you want to come to Chicago? 500 bucks a week. What? <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Did, but didn't that get, didn't you just sit down and your eyes filled with tears? I, I read that somewhere. <laughs> well, it happened because I, I, it was so, I was so overwhelmed and it was something I wanted as my goal. I didn't want to do it over Dick, the fact that he was leaving, but I guess that was a multi whatever situation that they all decided. But uh, uh, the fact that there was an opening even was just amazing. And the fact that I got it and I just sat down back in the barber's chair and I started crying. That's, that's the Italian and Sicilian in me. <laughs> I just, and I just wept. And, did, you, um, did you feel, did you know then that this was going to be a big break for you? It was a big break. It was a job. I didn't know what the future was going to be like, that it would be 1964 or 63, whatever it was. Clark's got a handle on that stuff there. I guess it was 64, Clark, right? I started there and I left in 69, something right. like that. You started about June of 63. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank That's you. <laughs> Dick left right before that, and I believe Art Roberts was uh, trying to do his show and Dick's for a short time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember all that. So I didn't know it was going to be the way it was, but, uh, you know, WLS was a 50 kilowatt barn burner, you know, and you could hear it any place in the nation. And finally, I had two or three young ladies there uh, answering mail for me because everything was by mail. And uh, we were busy. Art was busy, too. We were all busy that worked there, but especially the nighttime guys after sundown because we had such a reach. I have friends now in California, uh, Utah, all out west that say they used to go up on the high mountains or whatever to listen to WLS at night. And uh, a friend in Oklahoma and Tulsa, uh, who I've really been in touch with for the years, and he says, and I remember my wife and I had our first date sitting up on, I don't know, Strawberry Hill listening to you. <laughs> so. I'm a big music fan and I love uh, music uh, from you know the British invasion and you were right in the right in the heart of that and, and um, you got a chance to, uh, to meet the Beatles, you introduced them. What was that like and what were they like? What were your impressions uh, of them when you first uh, met them? I, I can talk about it to people right now. The hair on my arm still stands on edge. I, because meeting them and talking with them, and we always got a lot of groups into the station, and always I got millions of stories about people being in there and talking. The Beatles never came to the radio station, but I went to the Beatles, and it was a thrill to be with them at the White Sox Kaminsky Park. Uh, I was there, let's see, I don't remember. We split it up because they had two shows. So uh, two of us did afternoon, two of us did the nighttime, I think. But I don't know, it was Art Roberts or Clark that was with me. I think it was Clark. And anyway, we stood out there and they they wanted us to come and introduce them. And so uh, I uh, probably wore a blue suit for some reason. <laughs> and Ringo was standing there, he says, where'd you get that suit? I said, do you like it? He says, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so that was in, in the press room as we, as we went upstairs. But then when all this out, to, we looked out there at that sea of clouds. There were people, there were 40, 5, 50,000 people out there, and you could not hear anything. Just the sounds of their voices was electrifying up and down your body. I can feel it right now while I'm talking. We, we, and and I got out there and say, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. And that was all I heard the rest of the night. Wow. Uh, and it was, and then we had you know, a press conference before. We got a chance to talk with them. They were really nice guys. I mean, they were kids. And they were, you know, they were as welled up with excitement that was being generated by all of this as I was. I mean, they had no concept. 
that it was going to, they were going to come to America and they, they you know, we're, everybody's going to blow the walls down. You know, I, 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 since I, when I was uh, on Facebook for a minute, I thought it was too much work, but was I on Facebook, some guy in, um, I thought that was Kokomo, Indiana, sent me a note. And he says, Ron, I remember you for the Beatles show. It just makes, uh, you know, he just ex- get excited about it. He said, I was there with, with uh, my, my uh, twin sisters and uh, their girlfriend. And I said, oh, that had to be really exciting for them. He says, oh, yeah. He says, my one sister fainted and the other one threw up and, and the girl we had with us peed in her pants. <laughs> oh, 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 oh my gosh. Wow. Oh my. Actor fiction, I don't know, but it's a good story. <laughs> hey, Clark, do you have anything you want to add about the Beatles? I'm just going to say, you know, that I believe you taped that when it was like midnight. That Beatle conversation. We're filming a hard gay's night, and it was kind of cool because, uh, you know, I, Ringo, Ringo, what's up? You know, Robert, I'm David Robin. Oh, well, you can I come there and drive your car when I get there? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> talk to now. Um, oh, here's John. John, you want to talk to Ron, Ron, Ron and Art Roberts? So there they was on the phone. They, they ran it all the way down, and it was, I and mean, they were still on the set for a hard day's night, but I think. We, we, I think we did it late in the afternoon and they were in the evening or something. But that was, yeah, that was a, a good one. The reason I asked about it was because when I check my history books and find out all this stuff later on, they had actually just finished recording the theme of the movie, Hard Day's Night. The actual song had been recorded just before you guys called. Oh, Okay, I don't recall that. So, hey, this is shaking my memory tree too. So, I, I appreciate it. You know, guys, you know, it was 60 years ago. You know? <laughs> Think of that. I mean, well, they're, they're so well documented that you can find all that stuff out now. Yeah. But then, you know, contrasting when, uh, when the Beatles were broke, when they broke up and, uh, and Paul was together. Uh, with his wife, and they did the show with their group um, out at the, oh, I think it was um, in D.C. And uh, there wasn't hardly any press there at all. And I was the only one that got to go backstage. They only were allowing one or two people when it was just me. So Paul and I sat there for an hour. I, I got to the point I didn't know what to say. You know, <laughs> you? it was, it was but, I mean, it was great, but I, I do have it on, on real to real tape. So one of these days, if I can ever find a real, real machine again, I have to ask Clark for that. Maybe I should send it to you to transcribe, Clark. That'd I'll be, be glad to. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I'll be glad you're, to do that. You're the master of, you're the master of records, you know, that's, uh, and I don't mean the ones that go around. I mean, the, the records of what we did at WLS, that's it's just an amazing thing. And I, uh, you, you have a book too now you've written about it? Well, not me personally. I just, oh. I wrote a lot though for your documentary that hopefully they'll pass on to you. Here's something that the fans, one of the fans sent to, and I, I had this, uh, I sent a copy to Clark too. I don't know where that came from. They had it printed and sent it to me. Remember, remember Clark Riley's Rebel Raiders and Emperor yeah. Weber, we all, we did that kind of thing. How did but, your feud with Weber get started and what oh, kind of stuff did you do? My gosh. Well, I don't remember. Oh, I know how it started because I was a, I was a big um, Beatle fan and Clark, who had become program director and was doing the morning show, uh, Clark uh, decided he was going to like the Dave Clark Five. So like, like, you know, so it, it pitted sides. And so I used to do crazy things at night and he'd do crazy things in the morning. But I, you know, as I said, it was just easy fun. You know, we Clark and I used to tape some of the stuff early. And I hate to say tape because I hear those guys say it all the time on the news. <laughs> Roll the tape. Sorry, we haven't done that in... 25 years <laughs> but anyway we had to tape it and um clark i'd call him and uh, for example and blow a trumpet in his ear and wake him up because he had to get up early in the morning and or i'd i'd tell him i was a pizza delivery guy coming to pick him up and drop it off and finally i'm gonna get you in the morning <laughs> you know? and uh, 
And so that's what we do. I do crazy things to him, and then he'd say, yeah, in the morning, he'd do crazy things about me. So it kept the turnover going, and I, I think Gene Taylor and those guys all loved it because it kind of skewed the audience you know, from nighttime to, to back to the mornings they stayed on LS uh, and uh, to see what Weber had to say back to me. You know. But that's how it got started and answered you. Yeah. Thank you. But did you, did you want to show some other things? We had the Batman Club, too. Uh, sure. I can explain. You got some. Yeah, yeah. That, this, was a, this was a Batman Club sticker. And uh, I, got a, I got a note back one time. And I, I got a sad note, but it was a, it was a service man. Who, who was overseas in one of one of the battles that was going on during that particular time of the sixties? And uh, he said to, he saw a Batman Club uh, sticker on the back of a tank, <laughs> and he wanted to let me know. <laughs> but the Batman Club actually happened because WLS TV promotion department set up a deal where uh, I I would be able a, a spokesperson for the Batman start a Batman Club. Well, we did start the Batman Club, and uh, we gave out the, the the stickers here, and we gave out the Batman Club stuff, and it was all again silliness and fun. Gene said, "How many do you think you're going to need stickers?" And I said. I don't know. I said, I'm just asking if they want to have it. Uh, and I said, 20,000, 10,000. He said, what? And I said, yeah, 2010. He said, I said, you think that's too much? He says, no, I think that's probably not enough. We ended up giving out about 95,000 stickers on, on these Batman <laughs> club things. And um, I got the put the Batman club uh, on TV. He asked me to go out to Batman to do uh, a piece on the show called Ice Spy, I-C-E-S-P-Y, and it was with the penguin and all that. So I got to go there, and, and uh, Batman was a fun guy. He put a big star on my door of the trailer, <laughs> and I got, I got the word. I had, I had six words. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Wayne, there was a phone call waiting for you in the foyer. <laughs> that was all my <laughs> <laughs> they flew me out to LA and back. <laughs> uh, this was so, so much fun. crazy. Yeah. Those are great times. Uh, yeah. Clark, do you have anything you want to talk about with the Batman club? I'm just going to say that I, I sent in for one and, and, you know, you got your money's worth for free. Basically. I think you, you got it. You got a button. You got a sticker like you held up a, a bumper sticker. You got a window sticker. And you got the Batman card, which was signed by Ron Riley and Batman. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh. Told you he was a that's fan, bringing, Ron. <laughs> that's bringing back a lot of chuckles. So <laughs> you, guys, you guys who are younger, you know, you can remember it from a listening standpoint. We were the purveyors and had no idea what we were doing. My whole life was an ad lib at that time. <laughs> I, I just want to show you. Uh, I have a, a kind of a collection of T-shirts, but I have I have some that look pretty good. That's a Ooh, yeah. That's a, a LS shirt. Is it in the camera? Yes. Yeah. You no, got it. Okay. There's a, a fairly rare Beatles one. Oh, nice. This one goes. Uh, yeah. They had an album out called Real Music, R E E L Music, uh, and uh, this was a, a shirt that that came from that. Hmm. And uh, let's see. I feel like I'm hand hanging out my laundry here. <laughs> it's good laundry. <laughs> my wife will be very happy when I give it away someday. <laughs> <So> <laughs> another box out of his office. Yay. <laughs> so, Ron, you also sent me some pictures of uh, some of the artists you were with. Didn't I see you with? Uh... Oh, Peter Noon. Yeah, yes. Peter Noon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I sent you pictures of um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Yeah, and there were the Hollies then. That was before. And they used to come up to the station, and uh, and uh, we after we talked on the air, uh, they'd go back into the sales office and sit on the different phones, and we'd let kids call in and talk to them, which was really, really great. I mean, it was that was fun for them. And one day when Graham and all of those were in the back in the sales office, who walked in but Mama Cass? Who happened to be in town doing something? She had a long black 
a gown on. I remember that. And she was, had a rose in her mouth. She came walking and she said, I hear Graham's here. And I said, I, 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 I don't know if he's here or not. I mean, I can check for you. And she said, okay, I'll wait. And so Graham was in the back of the room. He's saying, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> She's been following me all over. <laughs> so I said, "Oh gosh, Cash, you just missed him." Yeah, right. He, I think he's gone on the outer drive someplace over at the Wrigley Bill. I, I really don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> she left. So that was that. That was a, a quick story about the Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I think there's a picture of the Beatles that were just run. They were running off a, a, a small airplane. I think I snapped that picture. We were out there with other photographers and waiting for them, and they came in on a. Uh, it might have been the Midway Airport in those days. What back when Midway Airport was M Midway Airport, and it was just small and very small and had and most of the planes didn't have jets then yet <laughs> so, is that share i see you with i'm looking at a picture sunny and share oh yeah, yeah yeah i got i got you babe yeah yeah yep. they were up at the station and um they they oh they i know um you, you crank my mind a little bit they had a movie in chicago or they had a movie which would came about in chicago i don't remember the title i don't think anybody else in the country does but but they rode on the back of the bus in the back of the bus and we rode a bus around and they went to the movie theaters where it was opening that that was the deal and that's uh, that's why they were dressed up like that they always dress like that in costumes anyway yeah but yeah. they were they were they were good people and she was so shy you can't believe it because I think she was about 16 or something, oh. 17. And she just sat at the back of the bus like this and like kind of cowering a little bit. Sonny was a big demonstrative guy. And of course, it turned around just to be the opposite. And then after he passed away, she was a queen, you know. And you know what? You've got a picture of Oprah when you were in Baltimore in 1981. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. That was that was when I first started over in television. I spent twenty years in TV after radio. Uh, I felt it was time to get away from the radio, and they thought it was time to get away from me. So <laughs> it all worked out fine. But anyway, Oprah Oprah worked there at um, at Channel Thirteen, and um, she was second or i think it was her second job i'm, I'm, I'm remembering that it might have been her second tv job she was in the carolinas and uh she came up and and um believe it or not she hadn't been there very long and i said you have any place to go for thanksgiving she says no not really i don't know anybody here and i said well come on to the house and so she, she came in and brought in one of her uh, co-worker friends and um she was doing a talk show there called people are talking with another person and uh, she was just ma magnificent. I mean, she was really talky, talky. You know, she she was meant for what she does now. And I'm glad everything's happened to her because she's a sweetheart. Ron, uh, talk, a, talk a little bit about uh, your transition from being on the radio and going on to be a very successful uh, television uh, personality as well. Talk a little bit about that. And how did that well, come about? You know, the transitions now in like within all businesses are, are a little more difficult now. Everything's on paper and everything's sending in a resume and everything is looking at all. And at that time, and I'm going to get specifically to your question, but at that time, it was, if you made a good name for yourself, especially on the radio with somebody, they'll, they'll take a look at you and, 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 and listen to you and listen to your tape, you know, and all of that. And, uh, it, and that's how we got jobs. Uh, I, I don't think I ever wrote a resume. I, I can't remember it. Maybe I did once or twice. Would Give us a would job one draw. Where'd you work? And um, so uh, what happened with the radio to TV, I was, I was there and, and came up to Baltimore and uh, I went into a, a station there for, as a program director for a little bit. And uh, we decided at that time to part company, uh, they were going country and I was going out to the country. <laughs> I was just, and uh, I was again, lucky because a guy who was um, out there in um, Rockford, Illinois, was uh, program manager of um, one of the WROK, I think it was, a Rockford TV station. And uh, he uh, called me 
and said, Ron, I've been hearing you since I've been living here now in Baltimore. And he said, uh, have you ever done any TV? And I said, well, you know, a little TV that I've done, you know, as I've been a guest all the time. And he said, well, we've got a show here. You know, it's a local show, but it's really important. It's called Bowling for Dollars. And I said, huh? And I said, I've seen it. I said, I don't know how to bowl. He says, that's even better. <laughs> so I did the show for six years. It was it was a, it was a hit show, and I would you know it was because the people made it. It was all the people show that we drew people in, and uh, you know, and the people were themselves. You know, one guy he came in, and I said, "I you, when's your birthday?" I said, uh, "He said, uh, oh, uh, now." And I said, oh, OK, well, this is your birthday. Congratulations. Uh, happy birthday to you. And he said, I, I think it is. Margie, it's my birthday. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's the way that's, that's how people were, you know, <laughs> to just, but they were wonderful and honest. They felt that they could be honest. And that was so believable that, that <laughs> people liked it. I, I said, uh, it, it's the one I, I said, you know, the, the, you bowl, uh, you bowl left handed, right handed. He said, why bowl both? I said, you're ambidextrous, right? He said, no, 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 I'm a Sagittarius. How cute. That's, that's <laughs> right along. I'm perfect so, for that show. <laughs> I did that. Well, then what happened was, was uh, at the station at 13, uh, one of the, um, Guys went um, on vacation, and uh, it was a meteorologist, and they didn't have anybody to fill in. He said, hey, uh, Ron, you want to try the weather? And I said, yeah. I said, I took weather courses, and I, you know, and I never got a degree in it, but I said I took weather courses when I was in college. And he said, oh. He said, well, okay, do the best you can. And so, you know, I got out there, and it all gelled. I stayed there and I got a job there and then later on when that evaporated for I don't whatever reason uh I went on to the channel 11 and then the channel 2 and uh I worked all three stations and then part-time for the, the Fox station uh, over a period of five or six years and then a guy called me <laughs> he said, hey Ron uh you remember me? He said, I was a program director at so and so. And boy, I remember that was a good time at WLS. Hey, we've got a station going down here in Washington. It's an all news cable station. Would you like to come down here and do the weather? I said, Yeah. yeah. I mean, how much? <laughs> you know, well, he told me it was substantial from what I was doing. So we moved up to um, um, Northern County near nearby Washington, uh, closer anyway, and I took the job and I did that 12 years. And then when I got out, a guy called me when I left. You're not gonna believe all these stories, but it's true. Ron, um, hey, you're not working at the uh, eight anymore. I said, no, he said, well, look, how'd you like to do weather on the radio for WTOP? I said, oh, look, I'm gonna retire, I'm near retire. He said, no, no, you do this from home. I said, I can do it from home. I said, yeah. And he says, traffic and weather together on the eights. <laughs> wow. I'm right, right. ABC seven. <laughs> you know, that's the way we did it. And so I finally, I finally did retire after 16 years in Washington and 18 years and almost 20 years in Baltimore and not in Baltimore, but in Chicago, actually. So You've had an amazing career, Ron. You really yeah. have. I've been very fortunate and I've met some wonderful people and um, I'd do it all over again. Probably not change a whole heck of a lot except not talk so much. <laughs> uh, Clark, I know you had a couple things you want to talk about. But my, my brothers, there were four of us brothers and we fought over the reel to reel recorder and the radio every night to record you. Especially oh. my, my brother Steve and I were constantly battling over who got the chance to record a Ron Riley exclusive with the Beatles or something like that, you know. But uh, I was just wondering also, you know, I'm a big Chicago music groups fanatic. So I, I friends with the Cry and Shames and the Ides of March and all these guys and I was just wondering if there you had any memories of the sock hop days in Chicago and and the bands you played or that played with you and what any yep. anything in particular? 
Yeah, well, yeah, I still am in touch with Carl Maurice from the Buckinghams, and uh, we met him a couple of times. My brother, who was with the uh, uh, Sony uh, Epic Records for a long time as a marketing specialist, um, he and I went out to the coast and uh, out to uh, actually Netherlands, Colorado, and uh, had uh, a good time out there, too. But we saw the Buckinghams and Carl and uh, had lunch with them. Uh, I remember, the, the, oh gosh, there's so many, so many groups. I'm trying to remember all of their names. Of course, Chicago. And um, I was talking to Jim Peterick just uh, about two or three weeks ago of the Ides of March. And uh, we were talking, he listened to the, he, like, like uh, we did, he listened to the yeah. British Billboard show every Sunday night. And that was uh -huh. just, I mean, you, yep. you, you let us hear so many British bands that we would have never heard. Well, you know, I was lucky again, uh, I'm fortunate that, that not only was I able to, I, I went to uh, London and, and the UK uh, several times while I was at LS and uh, uh, going over there is great. I met some great guys from uh, Beatle magazine and, and uh, there's a lot of different magazines that were out during that time. Uh, over the UK, and I got a lot of press in 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 in, uh, in England. Um, Ron Riley is uh, in Chicago is a fan of the Mercy Groups or the Mercy Singers, but I also in town. Um, and you know, you, I'm at a time in my life where just once in a while, you know, uh, I, I, I got a little blank spot here and there, but it returns. But I can't remember the name of all of the groups in Chicago that I, I really worked with and really liked. Uh, but there were there were a lot of them. Name a few. Well, the Cry and Shames were my my ultimate favorite, and then uh, the yeah. American Breed, the Buckinghams. Yeah, Sugar and Shadows Spice at and all Night. <laughs> yeah, Shadows. Um, the Shadows. Oh. Yeah, uh, Saturday's yeah. Children, all of them. The yeah. flock, we yeah. Um, every one of them, every one of them at our um, at our record hops. Um, we always had them, and they were kind enough. They were such good groups, and <clears throat> even though we it was a record hop and we played records, these guys would come in and do a guest appearance, and it was it was just magnificent and we'd always surprise the kids because you know all of a sudden the shadows and i did come on one night i really shook them up and i can't and fought oh gee well, i was one of the catholic high schools but my brother um it was real tight with so many groups and he was with Paul Revere and the Raiders and they had a, a concert cancel over in Michigan and Jim says they're not doing anything can I you go how about I fly them in uh, over and and have them at your hop I said what and these kids just absolutely flipped and I mean, it's a big it was gee I can't remember the name of the uh, it was near south side it wasn't Lane Tech or any place. I was. It was near Southside. It was, but it was one of the Catholic high schools. Uh, I recall. Was it and Brother Rice? Just, nobody moved. Nobody danced, huh? Brother Rice. That was it. Thank you. Bingo. You're welcome. Yep. Brother Rice. <laughs> yep. And yeah, the Raiders yeah. had you on their TV show in '68. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that was, was that was a good thing too. Yeah, I went out there and. Uh, and Dick Clark, too, uh, went out there for a moment on Dick Clark's show. And with Paul, I was just in the audience and sitting alongside the audience, as I remember. And Paul came down and sat there, was next to me, and we talked from where I was sitting. But I think that was the same time I was down for the, for the, uh, for the uh, Batman show. And I said, I happened to be in LA at the time. So I went over to where they were inviting me over, but it's been very, very good to me. And very, very. A couple of things. Yeah. If I, if I could ask still a couple more, um, I was just, it, I mean, Pam's probably upset that you replaced Dick Beyondy basically. No, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no you I'm were, <laughs> you were the number one ratings disc jockey from at least 64 to 69 in Chicago and yeah. there were so many incredible disc jockeys in that town and you went up against a lot of them too I mean Ron Britton were you with Ron Britton at WHK yeah I was I, I remember Ron when he came here too and we 
you know, we talked each other back and forth. It was never anything. Yeah, bless him. I'm sorry he's gone, but uh, you know, it's just um, he was he was he was a nice guy and a good competitor. Yeah. We always yeah. saw each other. It was uh, it was hey Ron, hey Ray, what's up, bud? You know. Well, I, I just okay. I just wanted you to re. I mean, I hope you realize how being number one against all of these disc jockeys was unbelievable. Well, you know, and, people keep, people keep telling me that. Clark and I and, and you know I don't I don't mean to put on a humble face I I, I don't I mean I'm very grateful it's just I never sought that I, I it, it happened I I don't know how to say it but I never thought I'm gonna be everybody in this town and I'm no I, I just I just did what I did and and uh, <clears throat> you, what happened happened and I I'm just. Well, the, the 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 feud album with Clark Weber, I have a copy of that, and it's my prized possession that you sent over to Vietnam, and uh, that was really something because it was quite uh, something that couldn't have been aired on WLS at the time, uh -huh. because you made a lot of comments that were more for GIs than for housewives to hear. <laughs> It seemed like at that time, but yeah. uh, and I'm also sitting here. I have a, a Ron Riley uh, form letter from WLS that you, your secretaries have probably your 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 uh, signatures on it. But it's so funny because uh, you make. I mean, that's the thing. You made fun of yourself so much. It was just wonderful with Bruce Lovely and stuff. And uh, when you at the top of the letter it says yes. I'm afraid it's a form letter. What a drag, eh? Yeah. <laughs> and then at the end, at the end, you have genuine. Well, hey, genuine. Be, real, be real. You got to be real. Why, why cover it up? <laughs> well, at the end, you you say genuine signature below, and then in parentheses, big deal. <laughs> to thine own self be true. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the thing. I mean, when people tuned in to your show, it was all about, you know, having a great time. You were having a great time. The people were having a great time. And it was just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was um, it, it, it was fun. And it was fun to be on top. I've been places that I wasn't on top in smaller markets or, or just a little cog in the wheel. And uh, that I was happy to do it. I was always happy to have a job. Okay. I, I guess I came from that stock and my parents, um, you know, they, they grew up, uh, you know, through the depression. And uh, when we were born, you know, we always didn't have, you know, everything we knew we had to work to get what we got and it just came naturally. And I, you know, that's, I think, is, is part of my success were, were the way my parents handled us. I mean, you, Ron, you've had an incredible radio career. You've had a very successful television career. But I read somewhere that you consider WLS the pinnacle of your career. Is that still accurate? Absolutely. Absolutely. Ra radio, TV. No, I don't care what it is, what I did. That would, that would, you know, not only was it in my hometown where, where, where I spent a lot of years of my life, uh, but the people that I knew and met and it just felt like home all the time at that time. But the station, it let you be a person, let you be yourself. Okay, what's the format, Gene Taylor, Ralph Bodine? Whatever it is, if we don't like it, we'll let you know. <laughs> wow, isn't that freedom? You can yeah. come, yeah. And later on, later on, everything changed the last couple of years. I mean, CFL got hot, um, you know, and they got another program director in and he was committed to, you know, making a major change in, in, in the station. So most of the stuff that was, um, 
important to us and successful to us was considered to be non-essential anymore. And now three heavy hits in a row. And the hits just keep on coming, you know, yeah. and, and read a little phrase book, you know, they give you, you know, where was mm. my life? Where, what happened to me? You know, right. and everybody felt that way. Art Roberts, Clark, yeah. everybody, you know. Biondi uh, too. I, oh, yeah, I know. And, uh, and uh, yeah, Dick, well, I, I'll tell you, talking about Dick, I hope everything's okay with him, but he's, he is, he was just a wonderful man. He is a wonderful man. And he's a guy that every time I got together, he was a great friend of my brother, Jim. Oh, they were always together. You know, they got together. And, uh, you know, it, it's just uh, that I think Dick kind of set the pattern for radio in Chicago. Uh, he had a personality on top of a pizza. Well, geez, <laughs> who would come on? <laughs> I mean, you know, nowadays you can imagine somebody doing that. You know, you can't. <laughs> That's why it's just a it's a choice thing he did. Uh, it was unbelievable, um, and he he did set the stage. We we all wanted kind of to be like Dick Biondi and as good as he was. You know, and. Um, I was thrilled, as I said, it won the, the chance of going to WLS. The guy thought I'd be working with Dick and find out that he was leaving, you know, and I was kind of taking his place. You know, he moved Art Roberts up to Dick's slot, and I was in Art's slot from six to nine. And, uh, you know, I was so happy, happy to be there. <laughs> you know? But then, uh, I didn't keep up with Dick, and he's, um, he's top, top, top drawer for me. Yeah. In 1968, I think, didn't you, uh, when you moved to late night on WLS, you were probably up against uh, Dick for a short time when he was at CFL. Oh, uh, probably so. You know what? You're going to think this is too weird, but I, I never realized, I never realized it. I never thought about what the competitors were doing, who was working opposite me. That was not a part of my mind. Uh, unless the salespeople or managers brought it up for monetary reasons, you know, that, hey, we you know, I got to add more curve drills or something. Um, as a matter of fact, and this is honest to God's truth, I'd go and do a record hop or something. I get out in the car. I turn the radio on. The first thing I put on was WFMT. I'd listen to classics. <laughs> and wow. I'd listen to classical music all the way home. Um and I was like that. Um, I, 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 I had to wash myself of it all the time. I had to cleanse my m mind of who was doing what next to me someplace at a station down the, the aisle or down the street. Um, it, it, it never occurred to me to worry about it. And that was me. I think it's great that Brad and Francesca are doing this uh, documentary and stuff and and uh, it's certainly well deserved that's for sure i'm kind of happy or surprised uh and and kind of humbled by it i i just thought it was so nice of uh, him to come across with it but i just why <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> why we just Lord? discussed why yeah. ron we just <laughs> spent the last yeah. hour saying why i'm excited I Luck. I wish you good luck too with Dick Biondi. You give him my best, will you? He's Thank always you. been a treasure and a it's, great friend. And both of you are doing a wonderful job of the show. I congratulate you and thank, thank you for making a part of it. Well, thank, thank you, you, Ron. Oh, thank, thank you for you. being on the show with us. And Clark, thank you for joining us. This was so much fun. Good to meet you, Clark. I this really way. wish that Clark Weber was still around to be on this so we could have you guys reenact the feud oh, again. But that'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Before I depart, uh, just real quick, how can uh, people learn about the documentaries? Is there a, a website, a Facebook page? Where can people learn more he's got, about it? He's got some stuff up on YouTube, YouTube right now. Um, just kind of a, a, a short breakdown of what he's doing and a, a, a funding solicitation, you know, I guess. 
you know, but um, it, it's, a, it's a necessity. But I think he's on YouTube, and I think it's probably under my name because there, yeah, you, you get Ron Riley, you get a whole bunch of stuff in there, and uh, yeah, that's some of the stuff now that he's just done. Uh, before I depart, just want to thank uh, the legendary uh, Ron Riley for joining us. Clark, thank you thank very you. much for uh, joining us as well. This has really been uh, a lot of fun. And, you know, just real quickly, you know, it's just really, you know, I, I, you know, my parents grew up listening to the likes of Dick Biondi and Ron Riley. And, and you know, I missed out on those very early special days. And it just, you know, just throughout this whole process for me, uh, being involved with this film, it's just, I come to learn, uh, you know, how special people like uh, Ron Riley and Dick Biondi and all those DJs were to everybody out there listening and, and, and watching, you know, that generation. Uh, you know, it, was, it just sounds like it was a really, really special uh, and, and fun time, uh, uh, you know, listening to those personalities, you know, you know, it's very, very few and far between, uh, nowadays. Um, so anyway, Ron Clark, thanks again, Pam, thank you as always. Uh, if you want to learn more about, uh, the Ron Riley uh, documentary, go to YouTube and search, uh, Ron Riley to learn more about that. Uh, to follow the Dick Biondi film, dickbiondifilm.com, uh, Dick Biondi film Facebook page and Facebook group. Check us out. And also uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you, you, Ron. And thank you, everybody out there. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Clark. Yep, All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody, and stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.